Uh, so for number three, for number three on the homework, number three on the homework is very interesting. So um, you should try to um, find the um, characteristic polynomial and see when you get two equal roots. That's, that's the only case where you can possibly have, um, uh, I, I do not have a diagonalization. So, so I think you're going to get a couple of values for that. And then uh, you should try for each value to see uh, if indeed it can be diagonalized. And you will see that for one of the values it cannot be diagonalized because you don't have as many eigenvectors as the... Um, so let, let's actually take a... Let me write the objectives down and then we're going to take a more concrete look at this. Okay, so um, so again, there was a question on uh, the homework for today, specifically problem number three. And let's discuss it. Let, let's make sure that we all understand what is going on here. So I'm giving you this matrix. Right? And... I introduced a certain terminology where by it's going to be called um, defective if we cannot diagonalize it, if we cannot find uh, n linearly independent eigenvectors. So you could ask yourselves, uh, what is the um, characteristic polynomial here? And the characteristic polynomial is going to be the determinant of X times the identity matrix minus this. And uh, It's, it's not so hard to find this because it's, it's I'm sorry, x minus a here. Uh, so it's going to be x minus a times uh, x minus one squared minus one, uh, which can be very easily um, factorized as x minus two times x. So you can see that the roots are zero, two, and eight. What does that tell you? It tells you that if A is not zero or two, then you have three distinct roots. And in that case, diagonalization is ensured. So, so what is really the only possibility in which you could have, you, you could not have diagonalization? And the answer is if A, so uh, possibly defective, if A is zero or A is two. Okay, because then you don't have uh, different uh, eigenvalues. Okay, so if that happens to be the case, so take these two specific cases and see if you can find enough eigenvectors. And if I'm not mistaken, for one case, you will see that you can find enough eigenvectors. For the other case, you will see that you cannot find. So eventually, I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, it will be uh, defective only for one of the two values. Okay, that's, that's what this exercise is about. And uh, are there any more questions?
No, 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 no. I, I, I gave you the example. You can, you can try diagonalization of any uh, three by three matrix. The reason I gave you this example on uh, Wednesday with a triangular matrix is because it was very easy to ensure that the eigenvalues were different. So, so diagonalization was guaranteed. I wanted to do an example where diagonalization was guaranteed. That's, that's what happened with that, okay? Uh, because the formula for the characteristic polynomial is determinant of uh, x minus uh, xi minus a, right? So every entry of a is multiplied by negative one. And uh, you said that we're going to put this back to the polynomial. No, that's that's what that's that's not what you're supposed to do. What you're supposed to do is take these values and take the corresponding matrices and try to diagonalize them. That's, that's what you need to do. So you will need to try to diagonalize this matrix and this matrix. And you will see that one of them is diagonalizable whereas the other is not. That's, that's what you need to do. Okay, any more questions? Uh, homework two is, is like the second example that uh, we saw. So, so no, I mean, you need to find the, the, the characteristic polynomial. So uh, you will need to find uh, uh, X. What is the difficulty, first of all, with number two? Because number two is, is exactly the, the, your typical kind of problem. So it's going to be X minus one, uh, zero, zero, uh, two, X minus one, minus three, negative one, negative one, and x plus one. So you will find this determinant, you will get the roots, and then you will just diagonalize your matrix, that's all. Okay? Is, is, there, is there any specific difficulty with problem number two? Uh, regrettably, the, the, the three by three example that I did last time was not saved uh, in the recording, uh, but uh, you know, hopefully you have it in your notes and that's precisely how you should do a problem number two. The fact that this matrix is not uh, triangular doesn't mean anything. It just means that you have to do a little more work to find uh, the uh, roots of the characteristic polynomial, that's all. Yeah, so, so you will need to, I, I mean, look, it's, it's uh, I mean, you can expand with respect to the first row and it's X minus one times this determinant and it becomes very, very simple at this point, okay. right, right here. So, so you already have one root, which is one, and then you're going to get a quadratic, which you should be able to solve very easily, right? Okay, uh, allow me to erase all these things and go over the, um, yeah, so, so I, I pretty much did, so, so again, let me, let me just say this and finish with this, that yes, when you have a polynomial of the third degree, there's always a, um, a question as to whether it's, it's uh, easy to find its roots or not. And, and usually it's not that easy to find the roots of it polynomial of the third degree. But here, if you take advantage of the fact that uh, you can expand with respect to the first row and the first row has, has pretty much many zero entries, then it's going to make it especially uh, easy to uh, you know, find the remaining two roots and then do your uh, diagonalization, okay? I, I, I will always try to give you um, if, if it's a three by three example, I will always try to give you something where you can find the roots in a, in a quite straightforward way. Any more questions, please? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, we, we addressed this last time, but let me, let me 
um, uh, repeat the answer. The answer is that, that uh, the order in which you're going to uh, choose to put your eigenvectors, which is your choice, there's, there's no correct or incorrect choice, will just determine what the diagonal matrix is going to be. That's all. Okay. And of course, the transition matrix is going to be different, but uh, it, it's up to you to determine uh, what uh, that order is going to be. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, let me do the, um, let's discuss our inner product spaces now. So here's how it works. The, one of the things that we encounter in, in Calc 3, and it doesn't seem like uh, we uh, saw it so far here, is, the possibility of measuring the length of vectors. And this is something that uh, we haven't been, we haven't done at all. The moment you start measuring the length of vectors, you actually impose, you actually can work with a geometric structure on the corresponding uh, vector space. So, um, It all starts with, by having an inner product. The inner product is going to be the dot product that we had in Calc 3. So here's how it works. So let V be a vector space. An inner product and here I should mention that it's a real inner product, that there is, there is a difference. There is a difference, unfortunately, between uh, the real and the complex case, and we're going to see what the difference is later. So a real inner product on V is a function, which we're going to denote uh, like this with a diamond brackets from uh, V cross V, to R. So, so in other words, uh, if you have two vectors in V, then uh, their inner product is a real number. Uh, that satisfies. It has certain properties that it should satisfy. Basically, it's a function. Uh, does anybody remember the um, intuitive definition or what intuitively was doing the dot product for us in, uh, in Calc 3. So we had the dot product for both two-dimensional and three-dimensional vectors. Does anybody remember what exactly it was doing, what, what it was good for? In some sense, it was a, yes, it was a scalar number, real number as we uh, gave it here. And supposedly it was giving us the relative position between the vectors a u and v. And also it depended on how long, meaning how what, the magnitude of those vectors. So this is something that is going to be, um, the case right here. And so in general, we want the um, dot product to be linear. So uh, u plus v comma w will be, or, or actually to, I should say bilinear.
and lambda u uh, comma w should be equal to or comma v i don't know why i put w should be equal to lambda times u comma v and uh, in the real case uh, the inner product does not depend on the uh, order in which you list the vectors and finally uh, what is important is that uh, the inner product uh, of a vector by itself is greater than or equal to zero. And the only time that it, it's equal to zero is if and only if the vector is the zero vector. Okay, so if you have these properties, then we say that we have an inner product function. And whenever that is true, uh, we have a very, very important inequality. It's called, it has, it has many names. My, my favorite is to call it the CBS uh, inequality, uh, which is referencing the names of three mathematicians, Cauchy. Usually it's called Cauchy Schwartz. Schwartz. Um, but uh, sometimes you also have uh, Bunyakovsky. Okay, how is Bunyakovsky written now? I hope it's written something like this. And I, I think there's a Y actually, to be honest with you. And I, I hate to mis misspell names. So my apologies. Inequality that uh, says that the inner product between two vectors in absolute value is less than or equal to the um, square root of the inner product uh, square for each of the vectors multiplied together, like so. And we have a name for uh, this. This is called the length of the vector. So the square root of the square of the inner product. So this is the length of the vector, length, magnitude, and there is a new word that we're going to introduce today, which is norm, norm of the vector. And it turns out uh, that the norm uh, satisfies some very pleasant properties. So the properties of the norm is that uh, it's always non-negative. The only way it can be zero is if you have the zero vector. The norm of the scalar multiple of a vector is the absolute value of the number times the norm of the vector. And finally, the triangle inequality that if you have two vectors, then uh, the norm of their sum is less than or equal to the sum of the norm. Okay, so these are the properties. Now, uh, these things may seem quite abstract to some of you. And that's why I would like to basically uh, reassure you that I, I believe in 100% of the cases from this point forward, we're going to work with the following inner product in Rn. So you have two vectors, let's say uh, x1, x2, up to xn and y1, y2, yn. And the inner product is exactly a generalization of the dot product that you all remember from calc three. So x1, y1 plus x2, y2, all the way to xn, yn. So that will be the inner product uh, that we will be working with. And the norm of a vector It is going to be simply the square root of x1 square plus x2 square plus xn square. So in, in some sense, if you, if you look at uh, the page that we just wrote, you will realize that for the specific example of the vector space that we're exclusively interested in in this course, 
And we really don't do many things with anything else other than that. We have a very specific uh, inner product and a norm, okay? Uh, and, and sometimes people do give names to this. They call them the, the standard uh, inner product and whatnot. And um, the properties that we summarized are the same properties that you saw for the dot product and the magnitude of vectors in R3. So, so pretty much nothing changes. The intuition stays the same. Okay, and, and actually we could we could go ahead even though uh, there's no need to, uh, I mean, you will see we will have to do a little more work with, with these vectors and we'll do that uh, next time. But for the moment being, all I, I can tell you is that everything that was possible uh, with a dot product in uh, R2 and R3 with two-dimensional and three-dimensional vectors is going to be possible here. And uh, does anybody remember any kind of things that we did using uh, the um, dot product, meaning um, any definitions that were based on the dot product? Does anybody remember them from Calc 2 or Calc 3? Uh, I, I was really looking for the projection, right? Remember, we defined the projection of a vector onto another vector. And of course, we're going to have something very similar here. And uh, we're going to uh, discuss it soon. So, so I should say that the projection of a vector um, u onto a vector v is simply going to be uh, inner product of u with v over the inner product of v with itself so these two are numbers on the top and the bottom uh, times the vector v okay so just just to make sure that we um, understand what is going on here. Uh, so this is the projection of, of u onto v. So that's how we define it. I, 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 it's, it's exactly the same notation that you saw in calc uh, three, right? Projection of u onto v. Okay, in calc three where we were working with um, geometric vectors, we used to say that the projection is pretty much this vector. So if you had the vector uh, v, so let's say the vector v is this vector right here. So this is the vector v and this is the vector u. Uh, finding the projection of u onto v is geometrically what I just showed you. And Uh, I hope you remember from Calc 3 that it didn't really matter, that it didn't really matter um, what vector you chose um, as, as the vector V, as long as it was uh, parallel to the vector V. So, so the vector V, we couldn't care less about what the vector v is specifically. All we care about is what the vector v is parallel to. Okay, so that's that's the idea here. Okay. Any questions, please? You know what? Why why don't we do a couple of computations so that you can all see how it works? So let's say that we are in R four, right? Uh, can you please give me the inner product of one, three, five, negative two with a vector uh, one, two, negative one, zero? So please give me this inner product. And can you give me the norm of the vector uh, one, one, two, negative two? Can you please compute these two things? Just to make sure that we all see uh, how this um, 
abstract definitions apply numerically. After negative one, it says zero, but I had forgotten to put the parentheses, and then I put the parentheses in there, and it got uh, smooshed. Okay, so here's a better attempt to it. Okay, let's make sure that we all did it correctly. So it's one times one. Let, let, let me actually write it so that you can see it. One times one plus three times two plus five times negative one plus negative two times zero, right? That's what we were supposed to compute. And this is uh, six minus five, I think it's one, right? And then uh, this one will be the square root of what? One square plus one square plus two square plus negative two squared. So this will be square root of 10, right? Uh, a vector will be called unit vector. A vector u will be called unit vector if its norm is equal to one. Uh, it's a very easy to get unit vectors. Is it equal to two? Uh, six plus one is seven minus five is two. Yes, you're absolutely right. Sorry about this. Uh, a, there's a very uh, simple way of getting uh, unit vectors. And it's the following. If you get any vector, oops, sorry. If you get any vector, which is non-zero, then, and you scale the vector by the Um, reciprocal of the um, norm of the vector, then this is unit. We had we had a name for this in Calc three. Does anybody remember what we used to call this process in Calc three? We called it normalization, right? We called it normalization. Uh, two vectors are called uh, orthogonal. So two vectors u comma v are called orthogonal. Um, if their inner product is equal to zero. Okay, and sometimes we write u is orthogonal to v. Uh, the truth is that if you have an inner product, you can actually uh, do all kinds of geometry. So you can define the angle between two vectors. I mean, somebody might ask how, well, the cosine of the angle is going to be simply uh, the uh, inner product between the two vectors defined, divided by the product of the norms. Okay. And it works pretty much in exactly the same way that it works for real numbers, because the, the truth is that if you have an inner product space, so an inner product space is simply a, a, a vector space with an inner product on it. So if you have an inner product space, then uh, you can actually define, um, you can actually, every time you restrict your attention to a two dimensional subspace, it's as if you work in a Euclidean plane, in a plane where you can do the usual Euclidean geometry. Questions, please.
So sometimes the kind of terminology that we use is as follows. So we say, uh, let uh, V comma, and we put the inner product next to it, be an inner product space. Then, um, a basis U one, U two, up to U n is called orthonormal. If the dot product between ui and uj, the vectors ui and uj is equal to one if i is equal to j and zero if i is different from j. So what do we mean by orthonormal basis? That uh, it consists of unit vectors, first of all. And secondly, any two vectors in that basis are orthogonal to each other. Okay. Arc. So, in particular, the standard basis is an orthonormal basis. We really want to work with orthonormal basis. Okay, so orthonormal bases are invaluable, and and so far we. We did not we consider things without this new component of um, the uh, without the notion of of uh, uh, length. But if you have the length of a vector, then uh, it it makes your life so much easier. There's so many more things that you can do. And uh, uh, let me give you one small example. Let me give you one small example. So, if you have an orthonormal basis. And uh, for the vector space V, for the inner product space V, V, and uh, V is any vector in V. Remember that when you have a basis, you want to be able to find the coefficients, the, the components, the coordinates of that vector with respect to the basis. It turns out that if the basis is orthonormal, then finding those components is the easiest thing in the world. All you need to do is take the inner product of V with each of the vectors. Normally, you have to solve a system. We've seen that. Normally, you have to solve a system in order to find those coefficients. I'm telling you that if you have an orthonormal basis, it's as simple as taking the inner product that basically do, does not involve solving any system or anything of that type. And we have a beautiful identity here that tells us that the um, square of the norm is simply the sum of the squares of the corresponding inner product.
Uh, this is usually called Parseval's identity. But can anybody tell me what this really is? Yeah, we can call it Parseval's identity, but, but it's something much more familiar than Parseval's identity. It is. It's a vector space with its inner product. Okay, as we said before, we have a vector space equipped with an inner product. Okay, that's what this notation means. A vector space does not have an inner product, uh, you know, from the get go. So it's something that needs to be required of it. But if that happens to be the case, then we call it an inner product space. So does anybody? Uh, see what identity this really is. It's the Pythagorean theorem. It's really the Pythagorean theorem, a, a vast generalization, if you will, of the Pythagorean theorem. After all, let me make this point here, that uh, if uh, u is orthogonal to v, then, u plus v square is equal to the norm of u plus v squared is equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v squared. And that's, if you like, the simplest expression for the Pythagorean theorem in an inner product space. Uh, it's actually quite instructive to show you how this is proven. Okay, so what is the norm of a vector squared? The norm of a vector squared is the norm, is the inner product with itself. Remember that was true in calc three also, right? Now by a distributivity, this is the same thing as u dot u plus u dot b. I'm, I'm saying dot, I mean inner product. And you can now see that since the vectors are orthogonal to each other, this is zero, this is zero, and what you get is simply the norm of u squared plus the norm of v squared. That's what you get, okay? Any questions, please? Are there any questions? There's one more thing that I would like to say that notationally, you might argue that uh, the, the dot product is simply the following thing. The, the double lines mean, mean, mean norm. In, in calc three, uh, we were using simple lines, but for vector spaces, uh, the double line will be norm. And again, for anybody who wants to make this tangible to make this Easy to understand, by norm we mean length. By norm we mean length, okay? Any more questions? Um, There's one more thing that I would like to say before giving you a break, uh, which is that the um, if you have two vectors in Rn, then uh, the inner product can be also thought in, of in, in terms of um, multiplication of matrices. So it's really um, the matrix 
the, the, the row matrix. times the corresponding column matrix. And in, in some sense, you can think that we have a sort of chicken and egg situation, which comes first, the multiplication of matrices or the uh, dot product. Because in some sense, the dot product it can be defined in terms of, um, I, I'm sorry, the, the product of matrices can be defined in terms of inner products of rows and columns. That's, that's what we really, uh, get. In, in, in fact, back then, when we first talked about uh, the product of matrices, I kept talking about um, the dot product of um, arrow and the column. Okay. So uh, let's take our break now. Uh, let's make sure that I restart the <laughs> recording at the end of the break, but let's take a break. Okay. Right. So welcome back everyone. Uh, I would like to share with you a little trick before we continue. I actually, before I do anything, are there any questions, please? Okay, so I was talking a moment ago about um, um, normalization. And there's, there's a wonderful trick here. So, so imagine that somebody told you normalize, normalize means to divide by the length pretty much. So normalize the vector, um, Three negative six nine. Okay. Three negative six nine. Right. I mean, normally you should take the uh, length of this vector and divide by it. Okay. However, there's something much faster, much simpler, I should say, not not faster. The uh, you, you will pretty much do the same thing at, at uh, the same way, but there, there's something much faster, which is the following. You notice that uh, this is a scalar multiple. It's, it's a scalar multiple of the vector one, negative three, uh, one, negative two, three, right? So, so whenever you have two vectors and one is a scalar multiple of the other by a positive number, they have the same normalization. So two vectors that are positive scalar multiples of each other uh, have the same normalization. Which means that instead of normalizing three negative six, nine, it's much easier to normalize one negative two, three. So I will normalize one negative two, three. And uh, the norm of one negative two, three is simply square root of one plus four, which is five plus nine, which is 14. So square root of 14. And pretty much the normalization is one over square root of 14, negative two over square root of 14, 
and three over square root of 14. Okay, and that's it. And that gives you exactly the same thing that you would have found had you normalized uh, three, negative six, nine. Of course, in order to see that they are the same thing, you would need to do some small uh, simplification, but they are the same thing. Okay. Uh, questions, please. So finally, uh, we're uh, we are reaching a point of doing uh, the um, um, one of the <laughs> most beautiful methods that we're going to describe in this course. It's called the Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization method. So what is the point of the Gram-Schmidt? orthonormalization method. Uh, we start with a bunch of linearly independent vectors. They could be a basis for all we care. And we end up with the same amount of orthonormal vectors, meaning they're going to be unit and they're going to have the same uh, and they're going to, to be orthogonal to each other. That span the same subspace. That span the same subspace. This means that if you start with a basis, you get an orthonormal basis. Uh, so if we start with a basis, we get an orthonormal basis. And we said how important it is to have an orthonormal basis. I mean, uh, or at least we might argue how convenient it is to have an orthonormal basis. Okay, so that's what the uh, Gram-Schmidt orthonormalization method does for us. And we're going to describe it right away. So, so here's how it goes. So let me show you how it works for three vectors. I, I don't think in this course, I'm going to ask you to ever do Gram-Schmidt for four vectors, um, but uh, it's going to be there two or three vectors that you will need to do Gram-Schmidt for. And here's how it goes. So imagine that you have the vectors U1, U2, U3, and we suppose that they're linearly independent. Of course, somebody might ask, what will happen if the vectors are linearly dependent and you try to apply the Gram-Schmidt method? And the answer is the method is going to break down. And at some point, you will have to divide by zero. That's, that's what is going to happen. Okay, so, so the, the nice thing is that uh, if the Gram-Schmidt method fails, you're going to realize that it has failed and, and you just stop right there. Okay. So uh, here's what you do. You begin by normalizing the first vector. So you take uh, one over 
u1, the norm of u1 times the vector u1. Simply speaking, you can write this also as u1 over, people write this way all the time, okay, like so. Okay, so the first step is to just normalize the first vector. Very simple, but remember the comment that I gave you, which is, or the remark that I made, which is that uh, if you can easily see some uh, common factor, then just delete it, okay? Normalize the vector upon deleting that common factor. It's, it's, you will find the same normalization, okay? Uh, that common factor should be positive. That, that, that's a really small detail. Doesn't doesn't really matter in our discussion, but but uh, you know if we want to be uh, formally uh, okay, then uh, we're going to take care of that little detail there. Okay, uh, so that's v one. Now it's kind of interesting what we do next. What we do next is we take u two. And we subtract from it. Let me actually give myself a little more space. Oops. So we take U2 and we subtract from it the projection of um, U2 on V1. Okay, and what is the projection of U2 on V1? This is something really nice because V1 is a unit vector. I will not need to have a denominator or that denominator would have been one. It's U2 comma V1 inner product times V1. So you subtract the projection of U2 onto V1. And then you normalize, meaning you divide by the norm of what you have just found. And that's P2. And now once you have seen this, the process is the same. So what will be V3? So you will take U3, the last vector, and you, sub, you will subtract from it its projections to both V1 and V2. So it's going to be minus U3 comma V1 minus U3 comma V2 times V2 and you normalize it. And that's P3. And this is where I told you that if somebody gives you by accident uh, linearly independent vectors, uh, I'm sorry, linearly dependent vectors, one of these denominators that you're going to get is going to be zero and, and you know, you're not going to be able to, to uh, complete the uh, normalization. Okay, and that's it. That's your uh, Gram-Schmidt method. And if you had the fourth vector, then in the fourth step, you would have to uh, subtract three projections. You would need to subtract three projections. Okay, it's the Gram-Schmidt method. Let's do an example. So, uh, the order in which you consider the vector matters in the sense that if you apply the Gram-Schmidt to a, a, the vectors in a different order, you're going to get different vectors, okay. So apply the Gram-Schmidt method to the basis one, 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 zero, zero, and uh, Else do I need? 
I need zero, zero, negative one, for example. Okay, let's see how this goes. Let's see what this method is going to uh, yield. Okay, like I told you, if, if they give you vectors like this, you might look at them and say, oh, you know what, I want to change the order. And that, that's perfectly fine. That's perfectly fine. But, but for the sake of this example, I'm not going to change the order. I'm going to do things exactly uh, the same way. Okay, so, so here's what I'm going to do. This is my U1, this is my U2, and this is my U3. Okay, so any questions before I get started? Any questions before I get started? Okay. So first I normalize U1. Uh, so what is the norm of U1? I need to find the norm of U1. It's square root of three, right? So V1 is going to be one over square root of three, one over square root of three, one over square root of three. Okay, so far so good. This is indeed a unit vector. This is indeed a unit vector and it will be our first vector. Okay. So then I begin by finding the vector uh, U2 minus the inner product of U2 with V1 times the vector V1. So what is this vector equal to? So this is the vector 1, 0, 0, right? minus the inner product of the vector uh, one, zero, zero, with the vector one over square root of three, one over square root of three, one over square root of three, uh, times the vector one over square root of three, one over square root of three, one over square root of three, right? And this gives us what? It gives us uh, one zero zero. The inner product is uh, one over square root of three uh, times the vector one over square root of three, one over square root of three, one over square root of three. And this will give us one zero zero minus one third, one third, one third, which is uh, two thirds. Um, negative one third, negative one third. So far, so good. And what do I need to do? I need to normalize this vector. This is where the remark that I gave you kicks in because instead of having that annoying one third, I can get rid of one third from everywhere. So V2 is the normalization of two negative one, negative one. And that's easy to find because the norm of this vector is square root of six. So it's going to be two over square root of six, negative one over square root of six, negative one over square root of six. So that's the second vector. Let's let's circle the vector. So this is V1, this is V2. Okay. Questions, please. Okay, last one. Uh, I need to take zero one. I need to take the vector u three. In other words, and subtract from it 
the inner product of u3 with v1 times v1 minus the inner product of u3 with v2 times v2. And this is the same thing as the vector 0, 0, negative 1 minus the inner product of u3 with v1. Allow me to save some uh, time and space here. So what is the inner product of u3 with v1? Can anybody tell me how much is it? What is the inner product of u3 with v1? Here's u3. What is the inner product of u3 with v1? Zero, zero, uh, and one uh, divided by square root of six? Uh, no, please be careful. The inner product is always a number. It's a number. So you need to take the corresponding products and add them. And when you do so, you're going to find simply negative one over square root of three. Negative one over square root of three times the vector uh, one over square root of three, one over square root of three, one over square root of three. Let's try the same thing for the last uh, for the last one. So minus, uh, what is the inner product between uh, u3 and v2? What is the inner product between u3 and v2? It's a number, it's one over square root of six times the vector two over square root of six, negative one over square root of six, negative one over square root of six. And how much is this? So you will find, um, so you have here plus one third everywhere. So it will be, Let's do it carefully. So it will be plus one third minus two over, over six. Minus two over six is the same thing as minus one third. So you have one third minus one third, which is zero. Then on the second one, you have again one third plus one sixth. One third plus one sixth is two six plus one six, which is one half. And on the last coordinate, here's where we have to be careful. You will have minus one plus one third and plus one sixth. Okay, so it's minus one plus one third and plus one sixth. If we clear denominators, we're go, going to get minus six over six uh, plus two over six plus one over six. So that's minus three over six, which is minus one half. There we go. So now we need to uh, normalize this. How do you normalize this? So V3 is the normalization of zero, one half, negative one half, which is the same thing, same thing as normalizing. You can multiply the whole thing by two, zero, one, negative one. And what is the normalization of zero, one, negative one? It's going to be, uh, its norm is square root of two. So it's going to be zero, one over square root of two negative one over square root of two. And that's our last vector, right? So what did we find? Let's, let's recap. What are the vectors that we uh, found? It was one over square root of three, one over square root of three, one over square root of three. The second vector was negative, uh, no, it was two over square root of six, negative one over square root of six, negative one over square root of six. And the last vector was zero, one over square root of two, negative one over square root of two. Okay, uh, a couple of remarks are in order here. S some people who 
uh, you know, may remember how you were doing things in uh, high school might ask, uh, okay, uh, are we allowed to have uh, denominators which are uh, uh, square roots? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that, that's strictly a high school thing that, that oh, you need uh, to have uh, integer denominators or anything like that. That, that is perfectly fine. Uh, the other thing that is interesting uh, is if you wish to verify that uh, these vectors are orthogonal, uh, that is going to be a very nice exercise actually uh, in, in arithmetic with square roots. So I will leave this up to you. Uh, had we done the um, uh, orthonormalization method using a different uh, order, for the vectors, of course, we would have found different vectors, but that's that's relevant. This is what we just found. Are there any questions, please? Uh, the quiz on Monday will be something like this. I, I will give you a bunch of vectors to, uh, to apply Gram-Schmidt. Okay. Gram-Schmidt is pretty much the most, one of the most important uh, methods. Um, interesting uh, remark here it even made it to a hollywood movie so there was a movie a few years back called hidden figures if i'm not mistaken uh it was about uh the uh african-american women that were working for the uh nasa program uh and at some point uh, somebody says do a gram schmidt on this and uh, you know <laughs> They, they, they needed to do actually Gram-Schmidt on seven dimensional vectors or higher dimensional vectors for that matter. And it, it, you need to be really good at uh, computations. Um, the square root of six came from the fact that the norm of the vector, v, of the vector of this vector is square root of six. That's where it came from. You need to normalize. Think about it. It's square root of two square, which is four plus negative one square, which is one, plus negative one square, which is also one. So that's square root of six. So that's that's where it came from. And and this example is, I, I hope it makes it, I hope we don't have a, an accident like we had on Wednesday. This example is is uh, very, very nice because of the different, of the algebra that you have, that uh, of the different operations that you need to do. Okay. Uh, let's take our attendance, last thing for today. And uh, of course, what else? Uh, sh send me the uh, name of the method that we learned today. Gram Schmidt, please. Gram Schmidt for our attendance. Okay, uh, great. And that will be all for today.